Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Lower Third Podcast. Uh, the goal with this show is to introduce you to people who are resilient and unstoppable. We're talking about the pandemic. We're talking about adaptation. What does that look like? Uh, and what does that really mean for people? I love talking to people who have uh, you know, done amazing things uh, that most people wouldn't push themselves to do. And so I love figuring out who lit that fire, what is that spark inside of them, and what does that look like moving forward? So I'm really excited today mm-hmm. to uh, have my guest on, Fareed, from the legendary 18th Street uh, Lounge in Washington, D.C. So uh, without further ado, Fareed, thank you very much for being on the show. How are you today? Very good morning. I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. Yeah, man. I'm uh, on the show. That's right. I'm yeah. super excited to have this conversation. You know, um, the last time I saw you uh, was at, you know, uh, Sam Burns Memorial. Uh, I would be remiss if we did this show without mentioning him because he was a huge part sure. of both of our lives. Um, sure, sure. Uh, and so it's nice to see you uh, outside of those terms. Uh, I appreciate that. Thank you. For yeah. sure. Yeah. So, uh, you know, for those of you who don't know, Fareed owned, uh, co-owned and co-founded uh, 18th Street Lounge, which is a legendary nightclub, uh, congregation spot, uh, home of live music uh, for the last 25 years, which just recently closed their doors because of, well, you know, I'll, I'll let Fareed explain, but I'm assuming because of the pandemic, but I have no doubt that he has uh, some other things on the horizon. So I'm just excited to kind of, you know, talk, sure. you know. Learn more, you know. So, so for so can you tell me a little bit about like how did 18th Street Lounge like form? Like, who did you f- form the operation yeah, with, so and how did that start? We started in '95, so it was the three of us: me, Eric Hilton, and, and Yama Juani. We, uh, so Eric and I were doing warehouse parties back then, you know, kind of like illegal raves before <laughs> raves became what they are now. Or All right became what they became, you know? Yeah. That so was kind of like, uh, we would rent out some big, big vacant space and, you know, put a sound system and get some DJs. Actually, Sam Burns played a couple of them. So, um, you know, we kind of had a, a fantasy of owning our own place one of these days and playing the kind of music we want to. So, you know, to make a long story short, we, we were looking for uh, actively pretty much on the streets, looking at, you know, for lease signs everywhere on the... In DC. So this was about 93, 94, I'd say. It was a very different city then, for sure. Oh, yeah, yeah. A lot smaller, mm-hmm. a lot more conservative. You know, there was, a, there, uh, as far as options for uh, leisure, you would have steakhouses and maybe college bars, right? Yeah. That would be too extreme. So, totally. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so, um, you know, uh, as, as we kept looking and, uh, you know, being new in the business and not having a previous lease, you know, a commercial lease w- wasn't that attractive to a landlord, right? You know, like we have a history. So anyway, we we stumbled upon a space where red became uh, yeah. a good place. So I spent a lot of nights in that basement yeah, for sure. And, and and I figured, you know, okay, you know, we can't afford a regular space. Let's go in a basement, you know, and just make it really raw. Uh, we weren't even thinking we could be able to get a liquor license. So we, we were kind of green, obviously. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, um, so when we look at that space, um, uh, the foreman said, look, you know, I, I don't think this will work for you guys to use because of, of the low ceiling, but I got a space around the corner that just became vacant. So we, we went to a walk around the corner where the sh- Shake Shack is and, you know, stumble upon what it, where it, it the will be. So, uh, it was kind of an accident, I guess you can say, you know, we weren't exactly like looking at that space, but it, it, we kind of stumbled upon it in an interesting way. So as, as we walked up, we were like, wow, this is an amazing space with the high ceilings and huge French windows. And, and uh, you had the, uh, um, in the, the original accents, you know, moldings on the ceilings and the walls. So, you know, it was pretty inspirational. So, yeah. so that's how the, the, the basic idea started. And we already had a following from our, our, our events and our parties. So we got, we got pretty busy earlier on, but we only had the first floor and the upstairs. Right. Yeah. It was just one real house at the time in the beginning. So, um, yeah, you know, we were, the main idea was to kind of play the kind of music that we thought would come across really well. And it did, um, you know, back in those days, DJ music, electronic music, I guess you can say was a bit more avant-garde and ahead of the curve. It was really burgeoning. It was fresh. It was new hip hop house, all that stuff. You know, it was, it was really, 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 um, burgeoning. So there was 
a culture to it. There was a club culture and there was a music culture where people would go to a specific club to hear specific kind of music. As opposed to now, we just go to the club to to be seen or buy a bottle or whatnot, right? Right, <laughs> right. Yeah, because also, you know, on the flip side, all the kind of music is available on your phone. So you, you, you don't have to go anywhere, right? Right, it's not, yeah, it's not a thing anymore, for sure. Yeah, it's not a culture anymore. It's not, so anyway. So uh, we, we, uh, we, we kind of stick to our guns with the music and uh, we had a pretty good uh, run for the first four or five years. And then uh, we decided to, to expand to the back, you know, build a deck, outdoor patio. Right. Yeah. So we did that and that it turned out really, really well for us. And then the, the, the year after that, we expanded to what the gold room is right now. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's a, a different building. That's right. 12, 10, 12, 12 was the original building. So, so the gold room is technically over Nando's then. Is exactly. that correct? Yeah, that's, oh, yeah. Okay. And we managed to get legal permission to punch a hole to just make it accessible to 1212. So that really worked out for us. And, um, you know, the, the continuing on the fact that that was kind of a different era, although it, it doesn't seem like a long time ago, but with the advance of, Technology. It seems eons ago, right? You oh, see the for sure. <laughs> Grainy pictures and yeah. So the culture was a lot different than that, uh, as far as in the club culture, right? So there was a scene, you know, based on specific kind of music. You had the you know indie rock kids, you had the house kids, you had the hip hop kids. So it, that's how it was, you know, alternative kids. And everybody had their own little spe- you know, specific look and. Um, you know, crew, I guess you can say, and, and they identify with that, with the, with the kind of music they like. So yeah. that was, it's not, we don't see that anymore. Uh, with, with, yeah. uh, maybe like uh drum and bass kids, you know, they might be like the most like niche, you know, audience, yeah. but I shouldn't say yeah. kids, people. Um, yeah. yeah. I mean, I hear you. I had Jenkos, you know what I mean? I was, I was a raver back in the day. I was going to, you know, 18, I was going to uh, five. Yeah. I was going to red i was going to you know capital ballroom i mean sure. I, I probably went to some of those underground raves that you threw sure. you know for the sure DJ culture was, was really burgeoning at the time it was still very raw and, and underground and um people made records you know djs made records to uh to play in their own gigs or you know the whole idea of you know touring djs wasn't that big at the time right. uh, if it was it was mere, it was more about bringing somebody from a different region or country where you can hear a different kind of music, right. not based on the name. Now mm-hmm. it's more about the fame. Is he or she really famous? I'll book them. You know, like it it's changed. not about, because you know, what, records that used to, that used to be sold in London were, were not the same ones that were being sold here. Right. Hence, when you get like a DJ from overseas, London, you're going to hear a lot yeah. of kind of music than what you would hear here at the time. So that was the interesting part, you know, um, but uh, we, 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 we ended up, we booked a few DJs here and there in the early 2000s before the whole, you know, guest DJ thing kind of blew up. But then we, um, uh, we uh, in the mid 2000s, we started to expand the week with, with, with bands and live bands. Yeah. So Wednesdays and Thursdays, we started with the Wednesdays with the reggae band with CI. Yeah. Yeah. We started upstairs in the jazz bar for the first few months, which is, which holds about 40 pe- 49 people. So it was pretty, you know, embryonic idea at the time. Right. So uh, the, then it, the, the night expanded to the outside deck because we got a, a lot more busy on that night for um, with CI. Yeah. And then eventually we moved into the gold room where there was a lot more space. So in that event, that night went on for about. 10 years, I'd say. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's legendary. I mean, well, you know, I should also mention that, like, uh, you know, I I don't know if you know this, but at one point I was like a manager or co manager of the empresarios. Uh, Okay, okay. Okay. Yeah, and so Javier, you know, Miranda and, and John right. Bowen are literally right. like my brothers. Right. Like I okay, talk to cool. them all the time. Like I just talked to JV a couple of days ago. Sure. Uh, and so, and CI, you know, because I, I, I kind of came up more in the reggae scene, you know, One Love, okay. I was booking sure. Uh, sure. like Soldiers of Jaw Army. Soja was the first band I ever booked in, you know, a strip sure. hall in Virginia in wow. 2001. Okay. You know? <laughs> so I was definitely like dialed into that, that yeah. culture, you know, for sure that, you know, even ESL was bringing to the table. It was like, uh, yeah, you know, Candace Mills, of, you know, amazing. 
they had a, they had a great, you know, st- awesome stage presence. Yeah. Uh, energy was really good. And the way it, so, you know, we, we kind of create these events, leaving, allowing the artists to have a free hand, uh, as far as what they want to play and how they want to play and how right. they want to perform, whether the DJs or live musicians, um, you know, I, I booked them for a specific reason. You know, if they're already in the house, then there's no need for me to oversee them as far as what to play and how to play, you know, mm-hmm. so they've already uh, achieved the, um, reason to be at the lounge. Right. Cause right. it's based on a specific kind of taste or image or whatever you have. Right. Or sound. So we don't, we don't strangle our artists as far as, you know, artistic creativity, you know, they have you know, free will and, and, and full open power. Yeah. So I think that's one of the reasons why these, uh, yeah, nights kind of continued and stayed and, and were relevant for about a decade. Usually 100%. these kind of events, maybe a couple of years or three years, four years, maybe, you know, and then it kind of changes, something happens with the club or with the ownership, or maybe the crowd is not what they were, what was, or anyway. So, you know, but, you know, considering that these guys are also professionals, that also really, really helped. So, you know, the, the, you know, being amateurs will, will, will make it a bit harder to continue a night for 10 years, I'd say. A hundred percent. I mean, that's, that's some real showmanship for sure. And I mean, you know, that's what made ESL so great. It was really true to its form. And like, I always had a lot of respect for the fact that you did live music and you did DJs because it seems like, I mean, and you know, how many presidents did you go through in the course of ESL, right? Like the city shifted and changed so many times. I mean, it's insane but like you always had live music and a lot of places went like strictly DJ or they were strictly live music. And then when we had that like wave of like mojitos and marble bars and, you know, sprinklers and bottles and everything shifted and they like pulled their sound systems out for bands and just went straight DJ. So I always like coming from a live music background myself, I was really, I mean, I grew up reading musical, you know, music and playing instruments and the whole bit. Um, super Irish, you know, instruments you probably never even heard of, but uh, I grew up with like the chieftains in my house every Sunday kind of thing. So, uh, you know, I love live music, but I also, you know, a good day, you know, going to church, son, Sam birds on Sunday night. I mean, that's like, um, spiritual, honestly. And it says yeah. a lot about you guys, you know, and, and the ownership and direction there that like, you just let that happen and you didn't try to control it. You didn't, phase it out. You didn't try to get Sam to sell bottles. Like you didn't do any of that, which is why ESL is such an important part of DC's like cultural music history. Well, you know, the rate, as I said a few minutes ago, you know, the, the filter, you know, they've already go through the filter when they already booked there. After that, they have all the free world that they want. Right. So they, um, I'm not going to book a DJ or, or a band that would not be able to fit with, with ESL and what we're, we're doing overall. Right. So, right. so, you know, with, with artists like Sam Burns, I mean, you know, it was an honor to have him on, on a roster. To be yeah. So it's kind of the other way around, I guess you can say, right. Yeah. That's what I'm concerned. So, um, yeah, you know, and we, we kind of curate these, these nights, uh, by, you know, being able to pick the right artists and the right DJs or performers, but also, um, encouraging them to continue on the, on their, on their existing path as a, as an artist. So, mm-hmm. you know, um, I follow them, you know, I'm, I have pretty good, um, I guess I can say I'm, I'm pretty well in touch with the local musician scene and DJ scene. So, so I have an idea of who could be able to fit the ESL vibe or the sound right. and, and that's, and, 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 and then being able to allow them to express themselves in a very free and open way then it, it, it really empowers the artists, I think. Oh, a hundred percent. I mean, if you just look at the stability, you know, I remember talking to Sam one time and just talking to him about like, you know, how important that, you know, weekly check was, you know, from you, it's like, you know, as an artist, it's really hard to find that stability, right. And yeah. things come and go and gigs change and ownership. I mean, yeah, right? it's like and, hot and cakes. People's and, expectations are, are really kind of, uh, you know, disposable, I guess you can say, right. You know, mm-hmm. they want this one night, the following night, if it's not working out, then you're not there, any, you know, working there anymore. So I, right. I, you know, I think artistic endeavors takes, take a bit of time to get some attraction. You yeah. can, you can s- s- see a result overnight or like in a week or two or even a month. 
You need right. to have the artist or the performer kind of do, allow them to do their thing, express themselves the way that they want to for a good amount of time. Then you can make a, a judgment call on whether it's, it's a viable effort or it's not, or if it needs to change any kind of directions or stay the course. Right. right. So, yeah. So what's, um, so I know that you've closed your doors and I, you know, read a little bit that, uh, you know, I was, I'm assuming lease, uh, complications, they weren't, yeah. uh, you want to expand on that a little bit? Like, sure, sure. So yeah, this is, you know, our lease was expiring in June, mm. uh, of 2020. And, um, so I've been in negotiation with my landlord since end of last year. Right. Back and forth. And then, uh, it, it dropped for a little bit. We picked it back up in February. Um, and I was looking for an extension of another, maybe five years or 10 years. How long on, was the original lease? Uh, well, we do the five, five years. It, it, oh, okay. Was, yeah. Yeah. So the f- original lease was 10, then we did five, five. So, gotcha. Yeah. Um, so the negotiation was continuing and then the pandemic hit in March. We got, you know, we got closed down by the city and I really thought that, okay, we're going to, I wasn't as informed as maybe I should should have been about the pandemic because it just kind of came upon us from nowhere. Right. Right. Um, Yeah. We went from like, you know, 250 to 150 capacity to hundred to 50 and then you're done. Yeah. Yeah. So um, as I start seeing, you know, at first I thought, okay, maybe a couple of months or maybe like a, a third month and then we'll be back to normal or, or right. get back to some kind of like, you know, operational mode. And I was even like looking to, I was, I was all, also in the planning stages of you know, planning the 25th anniversary in October. Yeah. Uh, Louis Vega was supposed to play with Sam Burns. That was right. the idea. He already got in touch with him and I was in touch with his agent. So. But uh, when the pandemic hit, you know, things change, right? You know, the, the dynamics change. And, and, and as I kept going and I, as, as I got more information into some more research, so it, you know, especially how it's going to impact our industry and specifically my kind of business in, my, in the industry. So hospitality got hit really hard and specifically dance clubs and live music uh, venues because yeah. it's... Uh, I mean, what, what happens in those places? You, you socialize with strangers in a, a dense environment with alcohol. So <laughs> it's just exactly a plan like, for yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like what could possibly go wrong. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. So, um, the negotiation had to change, you know, of course, as far as I'm concerned, because now with the new environment and if, when, with the change future environment of the, uh, of the industry, you know, the, the figures had to be adjusted and right. had to reflect the fact that, you know, it is a pandemic. And, and then as, as the quarantine went on, we were, we, we were cooperating with the mayor's office on ideas on, on how to reopen, what kind of phases and all that stuff. Cause the mayor's office had a working group, right? Like a recommendation um, committee. So we waited, we were waiting anxiously for that report and, and see where we, we would fall. So up to that, I was thinking about, okay, maybe we can adjust our concepts for a little bit, you know, tone down the club part, make it more into like a cocktail place or maybe dates, romantic events, maybe add some food, obviously all seated, maybe just the first floor and outside patio and you can stagger people in, you know, based on your capacity. Cause I was thinking, I was assuming we would be at a percentage capacity, you know, like maybe right. 25%, you know, in a 50% and then on and on. Right. But then, when the recommendation came out, that was the shocker because then we, we, re, I realized, okay, we're pushed back to phase four. We're, we're going to be the last of the last to open. So we're not going to be a part of any phase openings, any percentages, any kind of, you know, like lower capacity. Uh, even though we have an outdoor patio, it's not considered outdoor because all, the, all four walls are walled in. So that's out of the question. I don't have a kitchen. Uh, so, all right. Yeah. So, while the negotiation, the terms from my end changed, but also my idea of maybe a pivot also changed too, because I thought maybe we can kind of like, you know, slide through for, for a few months with this, you know, like a, a cocktail bar, something like a mixologist place, just to keep some kind of income going. And then as, as the phases open up, we can be 
you know, we'll get back to like regular full capacity sooner than later. But when the phase four idea came up, that completely extremely changed everything. Yeah. Then we're not going to be even allowed to, to have any kind of income until a vaccine is available. Mm -hmm. So, you know, um, as the negotiation were, was going, the landlord side was not, uh, offer was not reflecting the fact that we're in a pandemic and, mm -hmm. and I'm not going to be allowed to open until the vaccine is available. So, um, that was the, um, that was the biggest important, uh, uh, event that made me decide to maybe not continue, but also what well, as important, if not more important is what's going to be on the other side of the pandemic. Well, exactly. What, right? what does that really look like? Exactly. So, um, we can say, okay, I'm going to weather this huge storm right now. You know, I'll, I'll make it through, you know, being that accrue all this debt or defer payments or take loans, whatnot, or mm -hmm. pay out of pocket, whatever it takes. Right. But then arrive to a vaccine stage or a full reopening. But what is that going to look like in that mm -hmm. part of town and it's in, in, in DC? So, right. you know, well, there's a lot of things, a lot of um, issues and, and factors to look into. It's not just a vaccine is going to be packed. No, we have, there's going to be a, a lot of social changes. Mm -hmm. There's good, you know, first and foremost, the economic impact of this whole thing is going to be huge. At this point, we're not seeing it or feeling it. I think, I believe we're not, we're the eye of the economic storm right now. It's, Nice and quiet, but I think things are going to fall pretty soon. If mm -hmm. you ask me. You know what I, mean? I agree. August is, is going to get pretty bad if things, they don't extend the PUI or eviction notices and that business. That's, yeah. that's looming. Um, the fall with mortgages, car loans, you know, student loans, 40 million people unemployed is not a joke. No. You can't just you know, start back up with 40 million people unemployed. It's not going to happen. And also, pre-pandemic economy wasn't as amazing as they make it seem like. A hundred percent, right? <laughs> like your margins were probably already paper thin. I'm, I can only imagine your rent was probably offensively expensive. Yeah. You um, know, since, so uh, during the Obama administration, we had really good business in town across the board. <laughs> but ever since the administration changed, usually when there's a change, you know, especially if it's a Republican administration, business booms in D.C., especially right. in in the hospitality world. But mm -hmm. with this administration, the first six months, eight months, it was kind of a boom. But then it kind of, you know, stabilized and then it plateaued. Then kind of started going down in 2017 and right after the tax cuts that they passed, that's when everything went really south overnight. Across right. the board, all over town. We had about maybe 65 places that, you know, closed last year. Restaurants, bars, and clubs. So obviously there was a lot of overbuilding too. So, you know, there was a flood of restaurants and bars at one point, every corner had a, you know, like restaurant with like, you know, black and white tiles on the floor. Right. And, right. You know, right. <laughs> well, you know, and I say that and people get a little upset and I'm like, listen, no disrespect to anybody who has a bar or restaurant, but like yeah. there was too many of them. There just yeah. was, and I'm not saying they're not valuable, but like there was sure. just too many. And so it was making it really hard for anyone to survive because there was too many options and it was just, you know, and they're all great. They're all really well done, really tasteful, right. you know, great ideas, really great concept. But as you said, it was like, okay, you know, so everybody in the, in the industry became an owner, which is great, but there's, there's not an infinite amount of, amount of people, right? I mean, it's, mm. there's a limited amount of people. So, so anyway, you know, um, yeah. So the other side of the pandemic, as far as my decision was, was, was huge in consideration because, you know, I'm, I'm not foreseeing, uh, a dip for the, for, for in the, interim period and then a boost in the, on the other end. No, right. I think it's going to be like a, you know, really slow, gradual mm -hmm. rise. And more important, being in that part of town in a city like Washington, D.C. is going to be a little bit of a challenge to continue being in business and be viable financially, but also relevant uh, in, in the industry, in the marketplace. 
For sure. Well, I think people's interests have really shifted. I think that the pandemic um, has brought a lot of like pain and suffering and sadness and loss. Um, But I think it's also given people a lot of clarity. I think people are going to be a lot more intentional with how they spend their time and their money. And I, I, I don't, I'm not talking to a single person that's not like, you know what? I think I want out, right? Like people are heading out to the suburbs or to rural areas yep. or to, you know, yep. coastal areas. Um, I think the appeal of living in a city and hanging out in a city is, is not going to come back for some time. I mean, it's always going to be the epicenter of business for sure. sure. But is that where people are going to want to hang out? Is that, are they going to be willing to pay those real estate prices there anymore? You, um, you, you know, I had a similar experience. I mean, you know, uh, roughly with, you know, my last studio, I was in the Hyrick House Museum and I had this beautiful sure. studio uh, and then pandemic hit and I was like, you know, you know, the mayor shut the city down. I can't use it March. I can't use it April. I can't use it May. Like, you know, we're not even looking till mid June to reopen again. Like, can you work with me? And, and they said, absolutely not. They weren't willing to make any adjustments. And, and, you know, tout themselves as small business heroes and like raise yeah. money for people online. And I'm like, what about the small business that gave you $25,000 last yeah. year in rent? Like, I don't count. Like, I no. get no consideration. And I told them, hey, it was either your rent or my staff. And they clearly said, we prefer our rent. And I said, well, I don't. And so I'm out. And I broke my lease and they made me pay for time that I wasn't even there. I mean, yeah. showed no consideration. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and it's unfortunate because now they're getting no rent and I'm definitely not going back. And it's definitely changed people's opinions of that operation because it's like, you can't just ignore that this is happening, right? Like it doesn't yeah. matter what side of the fence you're on or whether yeah. you believe in masks and science or not. That's a whole other right. conversation. Right. But like, like you can't just pretend it's not happening, you know? And she's like, well, this is what our lease says. And I'm like, yes, but I need you to put down the lease and look out the window. Right. Like, you know you what I mean? The lease not expected to, have to be closed by the city. Right. Right. So, and like, you know, you're a museum and you have special insurance and you're a nonprofit and you're probably going to get money. Like, you know, but you're just sticking it to the person that helped you pay you your bills. Too. Right. Uh, and so it's just really unfortunate, but I, I feel like who you are really shines through when shit ain't good. You know what I'm yeah, saying? Like yeah, that's yeah, when you yeah. see what a, what a person's really made of. Right. And, and that's why, you know, when I saw that you were closing 18th street lounge, I was like, man, that's, it just felt sad because, you know, it's just like with Sam being gone, it just, right. I don't know. It was just as weird. But at the same time I was like, go for read because like, dude, you had a good run. Like 25 yeah. years is insane. For I mean, a, that's insane. For a, for a dude. Yeah. yeah. Dude, what is that? Like five times the average. <laughs> I mean, you killed it yeah. and you went out on such a good note. And I mean, I know so many people that you've employed. I mean, I just, I, I could sure. start listing them, but I would be, I would miss a few and I don't want to yeah. do that. But Keenan and Smudge and sure. Styles, I mean, you, you know, on it's and on and on. Run, you know, and it's, it's, <sighs> seems like when uh, it doesn't even feel that many years it it really yeah. it doesn't that makes me think that it was an awesome run because if if it feels really long i'll probably be, be dwelling on things that maybe i shouldn't have right but not but it seems like maybe five years maybe four years so. which is crazy because <laughs> yeah. i mean to, I feel young how about that so <laughs> i mean hey man you know we got a lot of life left in us that's yeah. Yeah. right that's the thing so you know i have no doubt because you're very creative and you you know you you understand business and you see talent in people you know how to nurture that so i'm you know do you have any ideas or are you just kind of like yeah. waiting to see you know well, what you happens know, the, the to continue on the on the post-pandemic environment I just des- described briefly and you, you you added to it is um, the, you know I don't think places in downtown areas are going to be what they used to be mm-hmm. the, the attraction of a downtown restaurant or bar or hotel I don't think it's going to be you're not going to have the office traffic you're not going to have the tourist traffic for a while mm-hmm. and you know you won't have the business travelers because you know, all the zoom, what we doing, right? right. So, and who so, wants to get on a plane? I don't, right. you know what I mean? It's I'm not getting on a plane somebody, right? anytime soon. Yeah. yeah. So no. that, that's going to like reduce a lot. Um, office, office usage is going to reduce a lot. There's all the studies about how there's there, you know, employees are more efficient working from home. Totally. And also, in, you know, employees are unhappy to have a choice. So, you know, like, why pay exuberant rent or mortgages in 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 DC where you can live outside of the city, or or like right. where you want to be in the, like in, 
in nature and on the hills and the mountains, right? Or at the beach, right? Yeah. Well, uh, and the other thing is education. If kids don't go back to school, parents can't go back into the office anyway. So uh-huh. it, yeah, commercial yeah. real estate is about to have a real reckoning. Yeah. So, you know, we did, we, we had a pretty strong happy hour business and that kind of like would also always you know, snowball our, our evening. Right. So if you take that out, then you're like an eighties club, right? You walk in there at 10 o'clock and there's one person there. Right? <laughs> I'm like, uh, yeah, I've thrown a few parties that were like that. I'm like, Ooh, Ooh. Yeah, you're the pounding beat. Drink, 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 and there's like one person there with a the fog like machine yelling at the bartender. <laughs> Can I have a gin and yeah. yeah. So, so I think the, the idea from, for me, the, the vision that I have is to, is to get closer to like neighborhoods, you know, to, to maybe be more East. It's a lot more, I guess you can say dynamic and burgeoning mm-hmm. uh, and will be because of the residents. Uh, a lot more creativity is accepted over there or maybe appreciated mm-hmm. uh, as opposed to say with the stale downtowns, maybe. So like uh, east of the river, like Anacostia's Ward 7, no, Ward 8? I'm saying east of um, you know, Connecticut Avenue or, or gotcha. Yeah, yeah, gotcha. yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, my east is more towards this side. <laughs> so, um, yeah, you know, like maybe towards like Rodan Avenue, New York Avenue, around there, you know, Eckington, uh, where you have walk by, where you can walk to the establishment, but also you can make a lot of noise at nighttime. So we, yeah. you know, a combination of of um, music elements and DJs and bands and a mm-hmm. good food program and a good, you know, awesome bar program you know, a really comfortable place. And I, I think, you know, after the pandemic is done, we're going to have this notion of coming almost, you know, going back to basics a little bit, right? You know, I the fanfare and the, and the hoopla and all that, you know, protocols might be not a, a pre, appreciative as much as it is now, or it was. Mm-hmm. So, you know, exuberant prices might not be attractive either. We buy a cocktail for like 14, $18, right? <laughs> I mean, it's not going to be, I don't think it, Thank God. Market, but it's, it's not going to be across the board, right? Which at one point, you know, every bar had like, you know, you know, $16 yeah. you know, cocktails, right? Which is insane. Yeah. It's insane. Like people don't <laughs> even understand them. Like you can buy a whole bottle sometimes cheaper <laughs> like, than one drink in DC. So I think, I think it's going to be a bit of a going back to basics mentality, in my opinion, and, and kind of um, going east of Connecticut, east of 14th Street, between maybe like New York Avenue, Rhode Island, Eckington, that part of town, that whole square around there. Yeah, there's some good yeah. options, man. Like Birdo and those guys been throwing warehouse parties yeah, and yeah. Uh, Juan Zapata. Yeah. They, they, you know, they put a lot of blood, sweat, and tears into that yeah. spot and yeah. really holding down the underground. But yeah, there's a lot of opportunity over there for and, sure. You know, like the the tourist environment, the business traveler is gonna be pretty sluggish for a while, right? Right downtowns are fed by those two groups and then also office workers. So, uh, so then the you know, office is, is be reduced capacity as well too. So why continue in that location and, right. and extend the lease and pay you know, pre pandemic terms for a post pandemic market, which is insane. I mean, which yeah. is why like, you know, like kudos to you for just like, you know, it's like, I feel like I did the same thing. Cause I used to have a Airbnb in my house in the basement. I had this huge house in Trinidad and, you know, always a bunch of different bad roommates, you know, coming in and sure. out. Sure. And uh, when the pandemic hit, I was like, Hey, the writing's on the wall. I'm going to cut my le- loss now. And I ended those leases so I could square my debt with my, my yeah. home landlord who has been extremely sure. patient with me, like shout out to them. And uh, just like, you know, you know, stop the wound. Right. Like, uh, yeah. and, and, and just sort of, wait it out and regroup a little bit. Right. So sure. I flipped my business to remote. So we're actually doing really well, but I've dropped my overhead like $7,000 a month, so which is, in, you know, you're, you, you're in the same boat as all the other you know, offices pretty soon, right? You know, all these offices and you know, all the law firms, all the banks over there are like, wait, why am I leasing two floors? At least half of one floor. Everybody works from home. You know, <laughs> executives come in once every two weeks or once a week, you know, stagger in and then that, and that's it. So that's, that's it. the new normal, you know, it and, is. And even when you get a vaccine, it's not because you, you, you can't have a lot of people in, in the office. It's a lot more economical for, for, for firms. 
Well, and once you go back, so I'm even noticing with my clients that we, you know, we flipped to doing remote podcasting and what we do is like, I record, you know, our audios on separate channels. So once we take this, like I'll send it to the audio engineer and he'll clean this audio up. He'll put them in a program and level them out. You know, you know, all that stuff. And then we'll send the audio, clean it up, attach it to the video. Then I send it to my video team and then they'll put it on this awesome template. And then we make social share. And like, you know, all my clients have bought like decent microphones and like, they know the deal and it's like are they even let's just say there's a vaccine tomorrow and things crank up are they really going to be willing to drive and park in dupont and go through all of that to come to my studio again i don't think think so so, you know do you know companies willing to rent you know all that space for never for employees no why do it when they can work from home right you know so that so, to, so the post-pandemic market was a huge weight on my decision because, you know, okay, you know, if that was looking maybe differently, like let's say, assuming it, if it was going to be, you know, huge carnival once we open up and, it's, and we knew that, then I would be able to work around this existing offer, maybe, you know, just you know, go back and forth and negotiate even more. But what's the point of, you know, waiting through all this huge storm coming through and then opening up in like almost like a you know Mad Max environment in downtown, right? It's, for sure. It's, well, I mean like, you know, tumbleweeds for a while, okay? Right. It's like, uh, it reminds me of Castaway, you know, with Tom Hanks <laughs> when he's like out there and he's like going crazy and he finally comes home and his wife is remarried. <laughs> you know what I mean? Wow. Like that would be, that's the equivalent of like waiting out the pandemic, doing the same thing that you were doing pre-pandemic and post-pandemic thinking that, it's just going to be the same. No, like, no, bro, no. she's married somebody else. Like no. you and the volleyball, that's <laughs> it, man. And you know, you gotta have a, I mean, and I think that's, what's going to separate the people that, you know, survive in business and people that don't is like having, you know, that awareness to know that like things are never going back. Yeah. Now yeah. they will go forward. They're just sure. not going to go right. back. Right. Yeah. And so, and maybe that's a good thing. Cause I mean, I know your rent had to be really expensive. I know that had to weigh oh, on yeah. you. And I know that your drink prices were reflected of the rent. I mean, I know sure. you weren't just arbitrarily making up sure. numbers, sure. Um, you know, managing all those people doing all of that, you know, and at the end of the day, right? Like we're paying leases. Like we don't even own those buildings, right? right? We're, we're, we're putting money in other people's pockets and like, where's their skin in the game? And are they willing to sacrifice? And, you know, uh, no disrespect to the owner of that building. I don't even know who it is, but like, did they create the community and the, right. the love filled environment that you did? Like that has to be, that has to be, that should mean something. And I hope that in right. the, in the new life that we're a lot more aware of like our, you know, eco footprint and like what we're creating, what, like what you do every day is who you are. Right. Right. And so, you know, you spend a lot of time, right. And I'm sure there's, you know, I mean, I I spent time booking people and I'm sure there's some people that hate me and there's lots of people that love me. You can't win them all, you know, (laughs) but like the amount of, you know, creativity and opportunity and stability that you fostered for so many people it should mean something. And I feel like, I feel like in old DC, it did mean something. Yeah. And then I just think we got too big for our britches and it just yeah. always became about the money. Um, yeah. and you know, and I think the reason why, like I was at this builder's dinner like two years ago. Um, every once in a while I'll go to those things just to like see what's happening. Right. And it was just like all these white people in a room congratulating themselves on all these developments. And this one guy, like the, I'm not even going to name the company cause I don't think it's the right one, but anyway, they own a bunch of stuff and they own the, uh, those buildings in Shaw that are like, uh, across the street from like flash kind of that new, like, gotcha. run, right. And okay, they just okay. keep going, businesses go in there and go right out of business. And gotcha. they're like, we can't figure out, you know, oh, the shade, uh, right? The shade, the shade, that whole gotcha. complex underneath it. Yeah, and they're they like, using, yeah, they're like, no we, we have, there now. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Which is actually doing well, but like other businesses came and went and, um, you know, they're like, yeah, we just can't figure out like, how do we encourage more businesses that aren't bars? And I had like, you know, I was like three glasses of free wine and in the back and I was like, <laughs> Like the rent's too hot because like people have yeah. to sell alcohol to pay that fucking yeah. rent, man. That's the only way you can make that bottom line is if you sell alcohol because that's where the profit margin is. Everything else is an yeah. expense. And then the city wonders, well, why do we have 3000 bars? Because you made it impossible to own any other business and have a real estate like footprint. You, they just did. And they don't, they, there seems to be like a huge disconnect there, right? Like, how do you not understand that $15,000 a month is too much to pay for a fucking cashmere sweater store? Oh, like, yeah. yeah. How many sweaters I, I just, you got to sell? I just don't understand. Yeah. Um, yeah. And 
you know, it's not, obviously it's not based on foot traffic because there's no foot traffic around there, you no. know, as much as for that kind of rent rates. No, yeah, um, right. There should be like a steady stream of people coming through there. And yeah. So yeah, you know, for me, you know, like it was like a really clear cut kind of a decision as far as that end of it is concerned, you know, with the, with the business end of it. So, you know, one of the great things of, of being in, in the same location is you build a lot of goodwill and a lot of history mm-hmm. and all that stuff. But then also on the, on the flip side, you know, there's a back negative end to it, which is your rent can only go higher, right? So yeah, there's no 25 years in the same location. You just keep going higher and higher and higher and higher. Now, um, as I said, the, the, the economics of this whole thing, you know, post pandemic is not going to work out for in that location. Now, right. you know, moving it to maybe closer to Shaw, Eckington around there, Union Market, obviously you're going to have, you know, and also less space because as I said, you know, 10,000 square feet is, is a huge place to fill up, right? A lot of space, That's man. Good. So again, you know, based on the economic foresight, you know, with post pandemic, you're not going to have that much of a demand. If you do, it's not going to be able to fill all the places in town. How about that? Right. Yeah. So got to go back to like a smaller footprint, a bit of going back to more to basic, uh, you know, add a food element to it. I like a neighborhood element to it. And then, right. you know, start, you know, but also, you know, keep the music, you know, aspect alive and, and, and well. Cause we're going to need that. Cause yeah. um, yeah. And I would say outdoor spaces. Like for I sure. have a tattoo sure. on my arm that says ATX and it's for Austin, Texas. And I'm not from there, but yeah. I went to South by Southwest for like six years in a row. First mm-hmm. time with the empresarios. And yeah. I was just like, I just fell in love with how practical they are. Like there's, there's like a building that was like gutted probably from a fire. So they put a venue, in there that's only open when it doesn't rain because it doesn't have a roof and they like covered the bar and they covered the DJ section and everything goes out. And I'm like, I love that. You know, especially the first time I went was, you know, eight or nine years ago. And it was right when like the sprinklers and bottles started popping in DC and everything became $14 and you're just like, what the hell? And then I go to Austin and there's like a band in like the, the middle of the road, you know, and they're like, Hey, there's a space we're going to use it. And I just love the practicality of that. And I love that. Like there were so many bars in Austin that have like tiny little space, but like a huge yard sure. with like sure. trees and picnic t- and just super unassuming and yeah. basic. And I, I loved that. And, and things were still cheap. I mean, I know Austin's changed yeah. even itself quite a bit since I've been there, but you know, I would say like having that outdoor space and just, you know, because what's going to happen is, even though, you know, all those things are going to be gone that we just talked about, but what's going to be left is, is us, like yeah. the people, right. And all those people who came to Sam Burns church sermon on Sunday night, yeah. all those people, like they, we, you know, not everybody is leaving. Not everybody can leave. And we're going to need a place to like, feel like so we have some soul again, you know, that's what I, what I talk about going back, going back to basics. Yeah. Um, that's exactly what I'm talking about because I'm, I'm, I'm foreseeing like, you know, DC in the nineties all over again. All over. I agree. Yeah. Which, which will be kind of cool. Honestly, yeah, I, mean, I might fall lot, back in love. <laughs> maybe a bit smaller. We, we can have mm. a, you know, we can recognize our community as opposed to just you know being lost in the, in the huge hoopla of the uppies and, and the uh, lobbyists and all that. Yeah. <laughs> oh my God. So I think, I think it's going to go back to basics in that term, you know, we're going to have the locals and the ones who've been here for a long time. I and mean, you, you're going to have an exodus for sure. But they, you know, those are folks that probably were here for work or they were probably the, right. The entertainment aspect of it. And you know, when restaurants, bars and clubs are done or like the museums right. are done, why stay here? But I think we have the locals and, you know, like the, the original community will, will still be here. And, you know, I, I do believe that we need a place to congregate and our places. And I think going back to basics is, it has been my, my go-to motto at this point. You know, I think, yeah. I think it's going to be, you know, DC centric, locally centric, you know, and, and, uh, obviously with, with the same kind of music in, uh, input with the bands and DJs, and obviously a food element and mm-hmm. outdoor for sure. Yeah. But yeah. I think I'm, I'm excited about that because I think it's, you know, it's going to be an, uh, much needed and just to continue the culture that, you know, Sam Burns has 
has um you know cultivated for all these years and yeah. you know, all the other DJs in town with this with our dance music and in the whole you know New York culture from the 80s or Chicago just kind of continues with it. Yeah. Break dancing graffiti and all this stuff. So yeah. I think that should continue and it will in a a different format, obviously, since we're all getting older, we're not going to be tagging buildings or something like that. Hey, man, don't 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 box me out. I might still want to get a little civil disobedience in, you know. So, yeah, and um, yeah, I'm excited about that part. So, but I think between now and then, it's it's going to be pretty interesting to see how things pan out. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm going to send you some, uh, a list of some books that I've been listening to on audible, like the last year or so, uh, like Tim Ferriss actually just came out with one. He's the guy that wrote the four hour work week, which changed my life and changed my business, like a complete 180. Uh, and he just came out with a book called tools of Titans. Uh, and it's pretty amazing, but I would just say like, you know, I feel like take a break, breathe. You know what I mean? Like, you know, this is the first, you know, that's the idea for the next couple of months at least. Yeah. Take a break, you know, come hang out at the beach, right? Like uh, read some books and, and arm yourself because, um, you know, it's a blessing and a curse that, you know, the community is going to rely on you, right? We're, we're going to rely on your business acumen and your experience and your skills and your relationships, you know, because it's going to be tough for, um, you know, the average person, right. You know, cause I, I feel like, you know, and you saw so many of us, right. Like created these underground things, right. One love massive and, um, you know, 88, like forward yeah, yeah. and all that. Yeah, I mean, yeah. there were a lot of people, you know, Juan Zapata and Jason Berto, like a lot of underground, but sure. it was a, a lot of individuals, right. Like me and, yeah. you know, yeah. people like yeah. real with no money, really just creating these things. Right. Yeah. And so I think that the future is like kind of a combination of that, like leaning on the community and then leaning on your expertise to like so. come yeah. up with the next wave because yes, DC will be really soulless, right. If they're, if they're, if, yeah. if we don't have something, Sure. Uh, to come back to. And quite frankly, like, I mean, I'm going to be like the most awkward hugger. I'm just going to be like, no, I need like three more minutes. <laughs> like, I, I know I don't even know you, sir, but whatever, <laughs> just hold me. Uh, and so I think even just thinking about having another place to go to eventually, uh, I think will give a lot of people like that little light at the end of the tunnel right now, which I think so many of us, you know, really, really need. We appreciate the vote of confidence and that, you know, that, um, I'm, I'm excited myself for the vision that I'm kind of coming in my head here and there. And, uh, um, I think there's going to be a need for it, but also I want to, I want to contribute uh, and yeah. uh, I want to continue the legacy that we've built. And that's been in, the, in DC for before when I came into the business and right. the after. And, uh, yeah, I think, I think there's going to be a need for, for, uh, also, um, kind of staying true to what we've done in DC for all these years, obviously, you know, right. with some adjusting as, as the environment re- re- requires, but, um, yeah, the, the post pandemic market environment should be an interesting one. And yeah. as I said before, I think it's going to be going back to basics a little bit. Yeah. Um, we're going to see some, you know, remnants of, or like, you know, uh, experiences of nineties DC, yeah, you know, where, where you know, I guess I call it you know pre P and Hoffman. <laughs> yeah. How about that, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly. The '90s in DC were a good time. I mean, it was a different time. It was a yeah. totally different time. But I mean, Small I miss population. it. Yeah, you had less of these, you know, less um, apartments and condos. But that really helped because, as far you know, I mean, it it helped you know bringing people in. But then it also kind of took away a lot of the original places or yeah. original uh feel of, of watching DC. So for sure. Yeah. yeah. Well Farid, I really appreciate you taking time to uh sure. hang out with me and talk to me this morning. Mm-hmm. And um, you know, I uh will put some links and stuff. I'll circle back with you on like anything you want me to list and uh sure. you know okay. stay in touch with me please and let me know how I can support, you know, I, I you yeah. know none of us know when this will be right, but uh, you know, lean on me as a resource, uh, happy yeah, to do so anything much. I can to elevate, sure. amplify, you know, your message and sure. your plan, um, to bring a little bit of DC soul back, uh, when, when the Thank time is right. And, uh, no matter where I am, I will be there opening weekend to, you know, I appreciate the word of confidence again. Thank you so much. I appreciate hey, it. Hey man, yeah. you know, you nothing but respect, man. It's good seeing you. Yeah. And enjoy your time at the beach. 
Thanks, man. Thank you. So thank you all for uh, tuning in to the Lower Third podcast. I appreciate you spending some time with me and Fareed this morning uh, to learn a little bit about DC culture, what happened, uh, where we're going next. uh, What does that look like? Um, Shout out to all the people that we mentioned in this episode. Rest in peace, Sam Burns. Uh, This this world, this planet, this city is not the same without you. Think about you every day. Uh, And please consider if you found this content to be valuable or interesting, uh, please share it with your network. A share of this podcast on LinkedIn really goes a long way. And we'd love it if you would subscribe on YouTube so we can continue to give you some great content. So thank you again. Uh, I hope you guys all have a great day. I hope we're uh, maybe providing a slight peek out the window at what the future might look like and how you can be a part of being a part of the prob- a part of the solution instead of part of the problem moving forward. Uh, thank you all so much. Have a great day. And uh, we'll talk to you soon. 